Happy Sabbath. How was your week? Busy, busy, huh? <laughs> well, um, it's always a joy to be here, and uh, it's always a joy to preach the word. I pray that God is with us as we go through this topic, which is so broad that it's very, very hard to summarize it in 30 minutes in any of the branches that this topic can give us. So let us pray in order to, so we can begin. Heavenly Father, be with us and open our minds and also give us the strength, the courage to practice what you have told us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the Israelites, and ultimately the Jewish people, they loved their country. They received a promise from God himself that he, God, was going to abide, to live among them, not only in the temple. God's plan was to live there in Zion. He wanted that so hard. And, you know, through all the prophecies, all the prophets giving messages to Israel, they received kind of warnings, then uh, notices of punishments to come, and then hope. And with all those, they created songs that are, you know, in the Old Testament spread out. And those songs was a way to learn the words of the Bible. If there is a way, a good way to learn any Bible verse, it's a song. So you know this. You know, you sing a song with a Bible verse, you will never forget it. Okay? So there's a song that I want to share with you. It's in the Bible. It's in Hebrew. And I want you to sing in Hebrew with me. So please, Harold. Harold is really good. He's very patient. I think, is this working? Okay, I'm going to come here. Um... This is found on Joel chapter 3, verse 20. And what it says is that, is that Judah shall abide or stay or live forever. And, and then the, the other part of the verse, which is the second part, uh, right, uh, is and Jerusalem from generation to generation. So if we go back, well, I'm going to sing in Hebrew. And you just will catch it. I know that. It's a beautiful song, very catchy, very sticky, and it's quick. It's not too long. So this is how it sounds. Vihuda le olam tesher. Vihuda le olam tesher. Let's do that together. Vihuda le olam tesher. Vihuda le olam tesher. Next, next phrase. Virushalayim le dorvador. Virushalayim le dorvador. The Jewish people still sing that song. I don't know if it was the same way back then. Maybe, maybe it never existed until recently, but it's a Jewish song actually that is sung today. So let's do from the beginning and let's try to, you know, take this song. Let's go. Vihuda le Dale olam teshev, virushalayim le dorvador, virushalayim le dorvador. Le olam teshev, there you go. Vihuda le olam teshev, virushalayim le dorvador. Virushalayim le dorvador. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Our chorus, natural, natural chorus. It's such a significant song for them that some of them cry when they sing this song. So it's very meaningful. It's a promise that God gave them because God made a covenant with them. And we can talk how we started, but we are going to try to navigate to the points we need to pay attention today, in my view. 
regarding the covenant. God made a covenant with Israel so they can be his people. And these people, taken from Egypt, has received the promise through Abraham, through Jacob, Isaac, and now the tribes are ready. And God takes these people that was oppressed and brings them out of Egypt and gives them Give them a new land, a land that has been inhabited for pagan people. People and nations that never recognized God as the true God. People that were, uh, that were doing um, abominations, really bad things. They were evil. They were cruel. They were selfish. They were hateful people. They just wanted to survive, basically. And everything that had a few houses was basically a little city. And a few more houses, it was called a nation. And then the little nations or city, na- or city nations, was, uh, uh, they wanted to get together and uh, pay a tribute to the bigger nations or cities uh, that formed uh, an empire or a kingdom. But Israel was a tiny city. Uh, I was talking to a young man this week. And he was asking me, how come Israel had such kind of obsolete, failing laws in compared to other bigger nations? They were a little nation, just starting. And God gave them the, gave them the essentials. The other nations were there for longer years, for many other years. And they were organized. Israel was just being a baby, basically. But God gave them the essentials, not only to function well as a society, but also to give the world testimony, living testimony, that there is a true God. And the covenant included a lot of laws. Wow, a lot of laws. It was not only the Ten Commandments, so you know. It was, it was over 613 different laws, different laws, different laws in very different ways, many things uh, regarding uh, planting and sowing and, and harvesting, uh, regarding uh, relationships, families, re- regarding government and, uh, and all that. And this covenant also included a part of each day, each week, Every few months and every year, a time is put aside for God himself and and a relationship with him. And this covenant was not only to be religious. It was the whole thing. Israel was to be a different nation. Israel was to be the uh, model of the world. Basically, through Israel, God wanted to restore the, the world that had been stained by sin, by death, by pain, by hate, by wars. God wanted to change the world through them. But time after time, Israel failed. So this covenant was broken many times by Israel. God always kept his word. He always was faithful to his part of the bargain, to the covenant. Another thing to know is that the covenant was only to be a temporary thing with Israel, right? It was not going to be like that all the time. This is very important because if we understand that the old covenant was only temporary, then we can understand that something else is to come, and we're ready for it. But Israel did not understand that. They didn't pay attention, and everything else that came later took them by surprise. So they were not ready for the new covenant. They were so attached to the old ways that they didn't want to let go. They wanted to stay Faithful because they were afraid to be unfaithful and then break the covenant again and again and then lose God's blessings, basically. So there was a time when they created more laws 
and they added more laws in order to safeguard the laws that God demanded that they kept. Do you understand that, right? They had laws that God gave them, but they put more in order to make sure that everybody kept those laws. Like washing your hands one time before food, given, uh, given to Moses, right? And Moses to the people. But also, they added six more times. In times of Jesus, it was seven times to wash your hands. Not necessary according to the law, but they wanted to make sure that they, that they kept every single part or every single law. Now, um, in my life, there are things that are hard to admit. One of them is that my dad does not believe in God. Basically, I, would, I should say he is agnostic. An agnostic is a person who believes that God may exist, but it doesn't have the proof to deny it, or may not exist, and he doesn't have to prove the, 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 the evidences to prove different. So it's kind of convenient in some ways. And my dad has asked me so many times difficult questions that you probably have heard before, especially from the younger kids, the younger generations, like teenagers especially. Why was God so different in the Old Covenant? Why was the Old Covenant different, so different than the New Covenant? Basically, a covenant that was hard, very hard, a lot of punishment, Violence, and in the New Covenant, we find grace and love and all that. And when I talk to my dad about this, it's very hard to kind of uh, eat together later. <laughs> because he is a little sour, and I am a little kind of frustrated because I think, forgive me for this, and Lord too, please, you too. I think that he should understand what I am explaining. It's so easy, I understand it. Why don't you? And we think the same sometimes when we talk to people, you know, in the outside. But then he comes back a few months later with the same question again and again and again. Why was God so cruel that even sent Israel to do genocide? You've heard that before, right? What happened? Why was the old covenant so hard? So, this is a big Thing, right? Now, it is important to understand that for God, according to Isaiah 28, it is very unusual to kill any human being. That's how it's defined in Isaiah 28, 21. He doesn't want to do that. Ezekiel 33 also declares that. He doesn't want to kill the evil people. He doesn't want to. He wants to save everyone. Every single human being. But there is a point when God has, obviously, according to this, intervened and killed not only tens or hundreds, but thousands. And it's in the Bible. And we should not, I mean, there's no way that we can run away of these realities in the Bible. But why did God do that? And... There is not a simple question like some people want to hear, yes or no. You have to go through different you know, stages of explaining this. First, we have to remember that in the context of these biblical stories, those feuds and wars among those nations or cities or families were in a context of ancient times, where the laws contemplated vengeance as a legal mean or resource. It is hard to understand today, but we should also remember that we should not judge the world before us with the laws of today. The world has progressed little by little to where we are today. And I think that we have to get better, right? Not only as a nation, as the planet, you know, socially speaking, morally speaking, and all that. But in the ancient times, 
including the Bible, it was legal that if somebody killed a boy in a family, the person who killed that individual shed blood from another human being. So he or she had to shed blood as well, replacing the blood, basically. It was the law back then. Not today, huh? <laughs> Not today. But it was something normal. I'm not saying that it is justified. But there is one point that, that helps me a lot to make peace with this because I don't understand it completely. I understand partially and also I believe that God is just, fair, and a loving God. But you know, we also find in the Bible that God protects the innocent, the weak. And when other nations came to invade and to take possession of whatever they had in a little nation or city, they will kill everybody as well. And God had to intervene to protect the innocent and eliminate those people who were basically predators. There was a custom in the Middle East or in the biblical world back then that the winter is really rough back there, but there's not as much snow as here, but it's cold, it's very cold. And every spring, when people planted, by the time of harvesting, nations that were, were bigger will come and invade and take the food. And they'll then give them food back, eat this and plant more. We'll come back in so many months and we'll get more. Otherwise, <coughs> So that was part of the custom because during the, during the winter, just like here, it's hard to plant anything. Nothing grows, basically, plus desert, you know, so it's very hard. So every time the spring came at the end of the spring or where the harvest was ready, they will come and take and then give them something and go. They didn't care about their effort, their work, their properties. They didn't respect any of that. They will just take it and go. And if the people confronted them, they were going to be killed. And God used many times, many ways, to stop those cruel nations. I have to say that there is one, one example in the Bible. In the book of Nahum, um, is tell that he was sent to Nineveh to tell them, this is it, you're going to be destroyed. But you remember that Jonah was sent there, right? And when Jonah preached, it was a different approach. Repent, and God will forgive your sin. Nahum came and said, this is it, you will be destroyed. The Assyrians uh, were so cruel that when they invaded these populations, they will take, peel off the skin of human beings to kind of say, and, and hang it on the walls of the city and saying, if you dare to confront us, this is what's going to happen to you. They were very cruel. They repented when Jonah came. And they lived a few more years, let's say, let's put it this way. And then a time came when they forgot. And they were so cruel again that God sent a message. And then later they were destroyed. We should ask, why is God requesting a pagan nation to live according to his will, to be merciful and kind, and do not you know, uh, destroy innocent or weaker people's property or so on and so forth? Why is he sending uh, this message to tell them you're going to be destroyed because you are too cruel? If they were pagan, wasn't God supposed to be only dealing with Israel? But now he takes time to deal with Nineveh. The point is that God doesn't like that the innocent suffers or that anybody at all will oppress the innocent, the weak, or take advantage of the weaker or more innocent. God doesn't like that. And if God destroyed Nineveh, being a pagan nation, without his laws, can you imagine what God will do to the people who has his laws if they are 
so cruel that they don't care about other people? Now, protecting the innocent was part of Jesus' message, remember, in Isaiah 65? I will, I am, the Messiah says, right? The Spirit of God is on me, and I am coming to what? To free the, those who are in prison, to give sight to the blind, to make the oppressed free, and so on, so forth. This is his first sermon in Nazareth. Jesus is here for that message itself. But now, it is important to understand then that in those times, people just wanted to survive. It's like when this country had the Great Depression in the 1930s. That depression, that depression took like 100 years in my country, Dominican Republic. People were starving to death. There was no food. There was no work. People planted, waited months to get something. They were eating just a little rice with salt. And... Women had to, light, to live when their husbands died or left them with the children. They had to marry another man quick because they, there was no work for them. There was little work for men, let alone for women. And they had to marry again and again. And many women was, were then uh, given the title of prostitute almost because they had several husbands. What happens in cruelty is very hard, in necessity. But people have to survive. And that's why in those times it was so cruel, everything. And God had to kind of intervene in an emergency way to stop the damage done to innocent people, the killing and the destruction. And on top of that, you know, the the laws of the Old Covenant and the commandments, they were kind of very well emphasized by the Israelites. They also forgot, but they, they came back and they left and they came back and they were faithful and faithful and so on and so forth. But then, then, that mindset of surviving in those hard times made them hard of heart. They had very very little sympathy for people who were suffering. And that's when Jesus came. And Jesus started preaching a different message. But let's, let's look at the Bible, and then we find that Jesus was the one who gave the old covenant, and now he's bringing a new message. And the new message is completely different. He tells the world that is listening... My kingdom has come. And the Messiah is saying, Now I tell you that you have to do different. Don't do like this. Do like that. And I'll give you just, um, I'll just mention one example. In the Bible, there are laws, uh, not laws, I'm sorry, prayers that are called cursing prayers or uh, imprecatory prayers. Like people will pray in the Israelite people for cursing somebody. Oh, Lord, please, that a thunder falls on the head of my enemy, my neighbor, because I hate him. And you give me blessings because I am faithful to you, Lord. And those are in the book of Psalms a lot. Like Psalms 109 is a very good example of this. You read it and it's, wow, it, this, this has happened. There's another psalm mentioning that, uh, that the, the children of my enemy are taken by their head and smashed against a rock. Can you believe that? That's in the Bible. But also remember that this poetic language, one, and two, is something that used to be normal in the pre-Jesus era because in those times... The, the priority was to survive. So people wanted to, to stay alive. They wanted to be there the next day and have food. So we find those imprecatory prayers or cursing prayers. 
And now, they're still being used. Some people pray that their enemies don't get the job that they probably deserve, you know, or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it happens. And I'm on a new era and the new covenant and the belief that Jesus brought a loving message or a message of love. On the contrary of those imprecatory or cursing prayers, Jesus taught different and he came and said, I tell you this, love your enemies. Remember that? You read that in the Bible. And, sorry? Right. And love your enemy. Pray for those who do bad to you. If they persecute you, you know that, what that means? They run you off your house, basically, to the woods or to the wilderness. And then you leave everything and you run for your life. If you stay, they kill you. So those who persecute you, pray for them. And if they do, you are so blessed because they did that to me also. Jesus said. So you see the contrast between the mindset of the people back then and the mindset that Jesus is trying to establish with the Christians, his followers, He's teaching them, if they ask you to go one mile, go a second mile. If they slap you in one side of the face, give them the other face. Yeah, but there's only two sides. The third one, you know. So, in a way, we are living in the grace era with some elements of the cruelty era of the old Covenant. Let me let me paraphrase. I mean, rephrase that. In the not in, in the old covenant, but the elements that are still, if we apply today, very very cruel. How could that work? So when we look at the two covenants, basically, most Christians today look at the Ten Commandments and they say, "Oh, I'm okay." I'm doing these things. But then they go to the New Testament. And in the New Testament era, here now where we are, there are some people that take the time to have luxury lives, hating others. And doing things that we're not supposed to. And I'm not saying that here is anybody there. I am one of them. We are not perfect. But we are called into a kingdom that is based on love, where there is no hate. I joke a lot with my family, and that including my wife and children, plus my brothers, nephews, and nieces. And I joke a lot. And every time they do a little thing, I go, hey, those don't go to heaven. You know, a little joke that is kind of, hey, you're not going to heaven. Because I just want to kind of mess up a little, tease a little bit. But truly, 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 if we do not live according to the principles of the new covenant, then we are going to miss it just as well as the Israelite did before. And we are not going to have any kind of participation in the new kingdom, the eternal kingdom of our loving God. So, what do we do? When we look at the old covenant and the new covenant, we have to remember that there is a lot of loss in the Old Covenant and basically kind of almost no loss in the New Covenant. Is that so? Well, I'll tell you this. Jesus was asked, what is the most important commandment in the law? Do you remember that scene, having read that in the Bible? Forgive me for not going to the Bible, but I think we can have this conversation. But, you know, he said, Love your God above everything with all your strength, your heart, and mind. And he didn't stop there. But he was asked for one most important commandment. And he said, and the second is similar. What means, what does that mean? Similar, please help me out. Huh? Alike. What does that mean? Alike. Similar. That if the first answer of Jesus is here, 
The second answer is going to be at the same level, just as important. He said, the most important commandment is to love God above everything, with all of your strength, mind, and heart. But the second one is just as important, and it is love your neighbor as yourself. And you know what? That is in the Old Testament among the laws that God gave to Israel. Leviticus chapter 19. This is something very important. Because all the laws that they had in the Old Covenant, Jesus is now referring as the most important commandment and splits that in two. And then he ends up saying, over these two very things, Loving God above everything and the neighbor as yourself hangs the rest of the law. Man, that sounds like a movie, right? Like announcing a movie. (laughs) But the rest of the laws, the rest, every law that you can find in the Bible rests on these two things. Love God above everything with all of your mind, your strength, your heart. And then your neighbor as yourself. And that is in the old covenant. And when he comes, he's announcing the new covenant. He basically is who makes the new covenant possible. The old covenant was sealed with blood, all the animals and stuff. But the new covenant was also sealed with blood, Jesus' blood. And allow me to read here on Hebrew, just to kind of... Uh, refer to directly to this verse, Hebrew chapter 8, verse 7. Listen to this, this is amazing. For if that first covenant had been faultless, in other words, if that covenant from the Old Testament was perfect, then no place would have been sought for a second covenant. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind. What's the new covenant? I will put my laws, says the Lord. To whom he said this? To Jeremiah. When was that? The times that Israel, Judah basically, was being, uh, was living in Babylon as a slaved people. Jeremiah told this and then The covenant is repeated here by the Apostle Paul in Hebrews, saying, I will put my laws in their mind. Put in Greek also means like sitting there, sitting there. And also, he says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, know the Lord here. This is how you know it. For all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. A new covenant. The Lord with Israel wanted them. He wanted Israel to have his laws in their minds. Do you remember reading about Israel and all the ceremonies and all the the liturgy and all the temple ceremonial stuff? They had skins tied up to their arms and to their foreheads and in the doors of their houses they have the mesusa and they have to touch it and kiss it meaning that they remember these verses that they are thinking about these bible verses all the time the purpose was to educate them and write the laws of god in their hearts and jesus is coming now to write the laws in our hearts And he made it possible. Now, we as Christians are called to have the laws of God in our minds, in our hearts, 
in a natural way. I remember preaching my first sermon here. I thought I preached for one hour. And somebody did a bad thing and recorded me. And it was 15 minutes, and I couldn't believe it. I felt I was sweating, nervous, you know. It was the first time preaching here years ago. <laughs> and I preached for only 15 minutes. It was amazing. You know, and I, I remember that day I preached about the mind of Christ. And I remember Brother, brother uh, Frist approached me and said, that was a very good topic. And I was, wow, after an hour, had to be, right? <laughs> and I always think the importance of having the mind of Christ and how can that happen? Because he promised to write his laws in our hearts, in our minds. How does that work? How does that happen? Through his Holy Spirit, he comes to our lives and he puts his love in us. And remember, the law of God summarizes in two points. Love to God and love to the other human being. What human being? Not the one you choose. Everyone. Matthew 5 at the end says, If you love those who love you, you do nothing. The Pharisees do that. So, you have to love your enemies, those who hurt you. And that is not easy. Believe me, it is not easy. But we must try. Because in this new kingdom, the force that changes hearts, lives, is love. If, you want, if we want to call it force. But God is love himself, and he wants to be in us. So we are called to look at these covenants as one unit with elements that portray the coming of the Messiah with a bunch of laws. But the underlying effect of loving the neighbor, loving the other people, is in the old covenant as well as it is in the new covenant. Let's not look at the different laws that are liturgy that had to do with the temple. Like somebody asked me one time, is it true that the pulpit has to be pointing west so you have east on your back? I said, really? I didn't know that. Yes, because the temple, you know, when you enter the temple in, in the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the patio, you know, I'm sorry. Right. The, you had your, the east on your back. You know, because Baal was being praised and all that. So, uh, don't forget. The old covenant is gone. It's gone. The underlay commandment of all those laws was love. From God to the human race and from the human race to God. And then from the human race to the rest of the human race. So that element is back there in Leviticus. Is also in the messages of Jesus Christ. So the difference in the old, between the old and the new covenant is more of some things that had to do with the temple that is not current or valid anymore. But the commandments had to do or have to do with relationship with God and also with relationship with the human being. As a matter of fact, I want to mention that the Ten Commandments never end. They were part of the Old Covenant, just as well they are part of the New Covenant. That never changes. Because the Ten Commandments, Jesus, remember, summarizes them in the New Testament. Love God above everything and the neighbor as yourself. The two parts of the Ten Commandments. So, where are we when it comes to our approach or perception and practice of the New Covenant? It is very strange to me, as a Christian, um, culturally speaking, um, I wasn't born here. I've learned a lot. I like this country. I love this country. I've been in the army, so I have put my share. But it is interesting, as I look at our Christianity around the world, how easy we are to hate those 
who don't think like us. And I'll just mention one way. We don't want to mingle with evil people, with bad people. My question is, how are we going to reach to them? Jesus was accused of being one that always was surrounded by sinners. We want to be better than Jesus, and we only want to be surrounded by holy people, perfect people, which there aren't in this world. So if we really want to live according to the gospel of Jesus in every way, then we have a calling from him, from Jesus himself. And it is to come and give ourselves for his cause. What cause? Save the world and get out there and get dirty a little bit. It goes away with this action. Soap and water later and then go back to the field and save more people. In the kingdom of Jesus, there is no difference in the sense of who needs to be saved. Everyone needs to be saved. And who are to bring the message? We are. And we have this new covenant that says, love, love, love. We are not exclusive. We are part of this world. We are part of this community. And I am so proud that this church is doing great things for the community and will continue to do so. But in the more personal way, I also think that as individuals, I have to save the closest people to me as well. My wife, my kids, help them save at least, right? My kids, my nephews, my nieces, my neighbors, my friends at work, the people that are on the road that put, give me the face and something else sometimes, it doesn't matter. I have to love them because we are different people. He wanted that for Israel, and they failed. They, also, they only focused on the superficial things. Jesus came and said, this is what's important, and he was so blunt sometimes. For example... He said, when you pray, don't do like the Pharisees. That they like to come in public and pray and loud and be heard by others. But when you're alone in your chamber, pray. And God will bless you. God will bless you. Jesus makes us different in the way that we are humble. We are helpful. We are servants. We are brothers and sisters to 7 billion people in this planet from different cultures, from different doctrines, political ideas, and all that stuff. And we will fight to reach them. And if they want to be saved, they will be. And if they don't want to be saved, we will keep trying until the last moment. This is the message of Jesus Christ. So, is there a difference between the Old and the New Covenant? Basically, no. The laws that had to do with the temple, that was only temporary to point to the Messiah. And he came and he gave us the permanent covenant. This new covenant that he has made with his followers is here to stay. So I pray that we as Christians, we all, learn to listen to Jesus and pay attention to his life and reproduce his actions. May God bless you.